Hello and welcome to this Japan Society webinar, one of our regular series on topics in current affairs and business. As most of you know, my name is Bill Emmett, and I have the honor and pleasure of chairing the Japan Society. Generally, these days, news in the form of government announcements does not shock or surprise us, as they are mostly hinted at or actively briefed about well in advance, such as the nature of 24 hour global news media and social media. But in September, we saw a dramatic exception to this rule, the sudden announcement of a major security agreement between Australia, the United States and the UK, the centerpiece of which was a deal to supply Australia with a new fleet of nuclear powered submarines penciled in as eight vessels and likely to enter operation in the mid 2030s. This was this AUKUS deal, as it's known by its acronym, was a surprise, most of all to France, a power with a million citizens in the Pacific and an existing contract to supply Australia with a fleet of 12 conventional diesel powered submarines. That multi-billion dollar deal, which had been signed as recently as, in, as 2019 and won in competition against other suppliers, including Japan, has now been canceled thanks to the AUKUS deal. Naturally, France is angry. It took the harsh step of withdrawing ambassadors to both Washington and Canberra, pointed angry words at Britain, and in the past few days, President Macron actually accused Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison of lying about what had happened. But the deal may also have been a surprise to China, good though its intelligence network may be, for it indicated that China's economic bullying of Australia its self-described wolf warrior diplomacy had produced negative consequences in the form of Australia joining the American-led deep water and long distance patrolling of the South China and East China seas as a form of deterrence against China, at least from the 2030s on. That is the point of nuclear powered submarines. Rather than patrolling territorial waters, they have longer range and can stay submerged and hopefully undetected for far longer and conventional diesel powered vessels. And finally, the deal may well also have been a surprise to Japan and to other American allies in the Indo-Pacific for what it might imply about the sharing of nuclear technology, about other technological exchange and intelligence exchange, and about Japan's role in American strategy in the Indo-Pacific. So this AUKUS deal both strengthened the Western Alliance and weakened it. It both answered questions about US strategy and it raised new ones. What are the implications for regional security, for the roles of the UK and Japan, and for future US strategy? To address those questions, we are very fortunate to welcome to the Japan Society two experts in these defense and security issues. In Japan, our speaker is Professor Kiichi Fujiwara, Director of the Security Studies Unit at the Institute for Future Initiatives at the University of Tokyo. Fujiwara Sensei has studied and taught all over the world, including in both the United States and the UK, and is the author of many books on security, including in 2020, a book with a very valid and appropriate title, A Destabilizing World. In London, our speaker is Dr. Alessio Patalano, Professor of War and Strategy in East Asia at King's College London's highly respected Department of War Studies. Mm -hmm. Professor Patalano has been in the UK, working in the UK for the last 18 years, having done his original studies in his native Italy, in Naples, uh, and then in France. He has studied in, and taught also in both Japan and of course the UK now, and his books have specialized especially in maritime security issues. Now, as usual, I'm going to ask each of our two speakers to give opening remarks of about 10 minutes each, following which we will have a discussion and most importantly, your questions. As the UK is part of the AUKUS acronym, it seems fitting to open with Alessio Patolano speaking from London. Alessio, welcome to the Japan Society and over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Bill, for the opportunity to join in this conversation today, and above all, for creating the conditions to mitigate Fujiwara-sensei 
uh, with whom I haven't had the, the pleasure to share a platform um, in recent times, as you can imagine, because of, mm. of, of how COVID has affected um, our lives in the last couple of years. And, and indeed, as you say, uh, what happened in September was um, a once in a life sort of moment in international affairs, not just because of the manner in which AUKUS was uh, ruled out, um, as you described, um, but also because of what it means. And so my comments today, my opening remarks, will focus on three points that I think are very important to frame a conversation around um, AUKUS from a UK perspective anyway. Um, the first is what I would call the Europe in the Pacific nexus, um, and in particular, uh, the UK in the Pacific nexus within that context. Because the question of the Indo-Pacific um, or Indo-Asia-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, depending on how you want to call it, well, I'll use Indo-Pacific because um, at the moment, um, a, a good number of, of, of countries and, and certainly the UK have adopted this uh, geopolitical framework to uh, sort of cast the net over the space that links basically uh, the coast of Oman uh, down to the northern tip of Japan and further south in the South Pacific Islands. And I think this, this question of the role and the relationship that Europe uh, should have with the Indo-Pacific has been now something that dominated um, the European debates in the last, certainly in the last year, um, starting with France and, and, and their own um, Indo-Pacific strategy, and then eventually uh, Germany, the European Union, and the UK with the Indo-Pacific tilt, um, that was uh, uh, presented in the latest integrated review, uh, there has been sort of an engagement with the question, what, the what is the, the type of role and expectations that, that in the Indo-Pacific should have towards Europe and what kind of expectation and ambitions Europe has for itself in that part of the world? When it comes to the UK, the integrated review gave a very specific um, reference to the fact that uh, the Indo-Pacific tilled or the importance to recalibrate. And here I'd like to emphasize that the choice of the word tilt as opposed to pivot of the Obama era flavor is, 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 is done on purpose because tilt indicates a recalibration. It's not as it's often portrayed moving away and out of Europe and towards the Indo-Pacific, rather is a recalibration of British priority uh, in order to take into consideration what in the integrated review is seen as the return of geopolitical competition and certainly the sort of defining features of at the structural level of international relations, that is the impact that Sino-American competition is likely to have on UK national security. Now, this is important because it presents the sort of the wider context within which um, I think at one level that sort of UK in the Pacific nexus is about a recognition of the role that the Indo-Pacific needs to have in the UK national security calculus, if anything, because of the structural impacts at one level of the Sino-American uh, competition, which is different from previous type of, if you want, uh, major power forms of, 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 of competition, because for the first time, the main hotspots of that competition are all maritime whether it is the East or the South China Sea, whether it is the Straits of Taiwan, and the core elements that underpin the dangerous or spot spots in the foreseeable future are fundamentally maritime. So in that sense, if you want, AUKUS is a wake up call, a response to that recognition, and in particular, a wake up call that comes out of the request from uh, uh, Canberra uh, to uh, help them review what they felt is a growing pressure that is the result of this fundamentally different geopolitical landscape. But from a UK perspective, this means this, this sort of like this broader geopolitical context, the rethinking, the uh, 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 recognition of the importance of the Indo-Pacific works in two ways. One, if the framework has changed and the geopolitics have changed, number two from unfolding from that is how that affects both international order and this hotspots being maritime at heart. It means that maritime order becomes the lighthouse, the, the place from where we get guidance on how do we see the future of international order evolving. 
and in particular how the rules that apply and the frameworks that exist to address maritime governance and maritime order are important because if we sort of change them in a way that is done by coercion or through the use of force then or by splitting the system uh, then that sets a really bad precedent, not just for the maritime order, but also in emerging new domains, such as cyber and space. So in that sense, I think the, there is this, this question of, 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 of uh, um, order in international order and how the maritime order or the Indo-Pacific speaks to wider question is one important element underpinning, if you want, what the UK um, or how the UK sees the impact of this return of geopolitical competition having an effect in its uh, international on its national security calculus. And the second element is technology. Technology matters incredibly at the heart of, uh, particularly in the sort of maritime centric international order as a starting point, uh, because technology and innovation shape how one engages with the maritime domain in the maritime space. And so underwater, if you want capabilities, Bill, as you, as, you, as you pointed out, still stand at the heart of the process. And let me add one specific point to this. The question about the nuclear uh, 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 powered leg submarines, not just about patrolling, but also in terms of continuous nature of, 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 of energy supply to the platform, and therefore the potentially presents to introduce new type of technologies um, as they come in over time, um, and the ability to integrate them into your existing platforms. So that's number one, the Europe in the Pacific nexus and, and, and the first point I wanted to make. The second one is about the link between the, the, what I call the prosperity security nexus. From a UK perspective, AUKUS is about uh, also uh, a recognition that there is no prosperity without security. For the reasons that I mentioned before, um, the um, uh, fundamental understanding in, in terms of coming to the aid of a long-term partner and ally, or the, as, as, as the Prime Minister put it when the August uh, Pact was announced, really is very much this recognition in the integrated review that there is no possibility of prosperity without security, and in particular, in a maritime led order that defines how we connect um, globally, um, this means in particular um, addressing questions that are relevant to the strategic balance in the maritime space and in maritime domain. But it's not just about, or let me put it this way, this, this prosperity security nexus means that security matters and there is no security without prosperity, but prosperity is still the central goal. Let's not forget that AUKUS might be the first deliverable on the Indo-Pacific tilt. But it comes on the back of a number of other initiatives by the UK government in terms of uh, political re-engagement and economic re-engagement. Here, I want to mention the um, ASEAN uh, partner dialogue uh, uh, status uh, for the UK, as well as the application to CPTPP, as well as the interest that the UK has uh, had on processes like ASEAN. So, there is no sort of just security focus. That security dimension speaks to this broader understanding that prosperity and security sit in the same space, but one cannot exist without the other. Um, this implies also for the UK in terms of, 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 of defense posture, um, a, re a, a sort of re-engineering of its defense posture in a way that is more forward leaning in order to uh, uh, sort of contribute in a meaningful fashion to the role that places like the Indo-Pacific are likely to play in the um, uh, sort of stability of international affairs. And this, this is my third point, the military constabulary nexus. The type of issues that unfold from the uh, maritime order and the maritime domain that is the central to the Sino-American competition and the stability of the Indo-Pacific are both of a strategic and governance related nature. In the sense that these spaces, the Indian Ocean and the, the Pacific, as well as the sub theaters in it, whether it is the South Pacific, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, the Philippine Sea, um, uh, uh, um, they all sort of uh, speak to at least two set of correlated, but yet not always fully overlapping issues. One is the strategic balance, right? And the operational balance that exists in order for states to project power through the sea and from the sea. And the other one is a behavioral balance in terms of how 
coastal states' um, uh, uh, sovereignty is manifested and projected in the maritime domain. Two examples to sort of explain this better. Um, if you think about the East China Sea and the disputes between Japan and China over the uh, Senkaku Yaoyu Islands, there you've got a situation in which that governance balance, how you manage a, a different view, if you want, um, on outstanding territorial uh, dispute, um, has first and foremost impacts on the governance dimension of the maritime peace. It has also strategic ones, but first and foremost is governance. On the other hand, if you look at the South China Sea, the artificial islands are constructed, even though the argument has been set by the Chinese government in terms of ascertaining its claims, fundamentally has contributed to the, the operational balance, the strategic picture in that space. So AUKUS, within this broader context of that military constabulary nexus, represents both a down payment in terms of uh, uh, the possibility to uh, uh, rebalance, if you want, that operational space that speaks to the military dimension of the Indo-Pacific uh, issue. But it also represents a political commitment and the roadmap, if, if you want, for the Indo-Pacific tilt implementation. In what sense? In the sense that it speaks to where the United Kingdom, uh, where Britain will have opportunities to identify how it can me, me, provide a meaningful contribution without over-promising and then under-delivering it. There is a, a leading edge that the UK still possesses in terms of nuclear reactors and in the field of nuclear-powered submarines. That's one element that AUKUS story is telling us. But what is equally important is that as AUKUS was being unrolled, the first two offshore patrol vessels uh, that were sort of earmarked for a forward operational deployment in the Indo-Pacific were making their way to the region, which speaks to that governance piece and the place in which the UK, I think, with its limited capabilities, is sort of uh, selecting the spaces in which it can be a complementary actor to its other partners and allies, and an actor that can work in that sort of shaping dimension of that sort of governance and constabulary piece of the regional security. So to conclude and bringing things together, the three points and the three nexuses. From a Europe sort of Indo-Pacific nexus, I think the point number one to take away is that it's a recognition of the UK. AUKUS is a recognition of the importance of the Indo-Pacific in international geopolitics, of the changing nature of international uh, geopolitics, um, and how the UK sees itself as, uh, uh, as, 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 as an actor that can play a constructive role in addressing that changes and committed to address that change. From the perspective of the prosperity security nexus, it's very much about um, uh, 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 um, a country that sees a relationship that cannot be disentangled between security and prosperity, but in which both of them matters and ordering them rather than choosing one and the other is the way forward. And from the perspective of that military constabulary nexus, you've got that sense of complementarity and integration with partners and allies in the region in order to make a contribution that does not overpromise and hopefully does not underdeliver. Now, we're at the beginning, a lot needs to be done, a lot of sort of problems that are facing us, but that's a matter for us to discuss over the next few minutes. Thank you very much, and I'll stop here. Marvellous. Thank you very much, uh, Alessio. And uh, thank you especially for those that structure as well to think about it to do with the Indo-Pacific nexus, the prosperity security nexus, and the military constabulary nexus. Probably more nexuses than I've had in a, in a morning <laughs> for some time. But that's terrific. And uh, now, uh, uh, Kiichi uh, Fujiwara in Tokyo, you, you, you've been listening patiently to uh, two Europeans talking about the Indo-Pacific. There you are, sitting in the Indo-Pacific, <laughs> really yourself. Um, how does it view, how does it all look to you and how does it fit in for you uh, and for Japan? No, thank you, Bill, and thank you for this invitation for this wonderful meeting. Yes, uh, when August was announced, um, it was a bit of a surprise to be very honest with you. And I 
don't think uh, Japanese specialists or practitioners um, could really make up their minds. Uh, should we welcome this or should we be alarmed? Um, what is this? Um, and it's, that itself is quite um, paradoxical. Um, Alessio just um, brought up this issue about Euro-Pacific nexus. That's one of the nexuses discussed here. Uh, as we can see, the Western Alliance is composed of two um, different components. One um, is, of course, NATO, and the other is the eight alliances in Asia, uh, which are essentially bilateral. It doesn't really have a multilateral network. Uh, so the so-called hub and spokes is not much of an institution. It's essentially bilateral agreements. And then also uh, there was an issue on whether the two blocks, if I may, Europe and Pacific, um, the European Alliance and the Asian alliances could be brought together. Now um, on this, Japan was an advocate um, of increasing um, the ties, connections between NATO, NATO powers and um, Asian allies. <clears throat> Using the word Indo-Pacific itself, was taken to be a Japanese foreign policy victory. And I still remember um, my colleagues um, so happy listening to uh, Mr. Trump using the word Indo-Pacific uh, as if it came from the mouth uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, um, and this and also involves on how we can invite India into the network. And then Japan, of course, was a strongly supporting quad that involves on Australia and the United States and India and Japan, um, observing China's activities that, um, that um, cover a wide range, including uh, South, Asia, South Asia, and quad was um, taken to be a welcome development for Japan. And of course, um, uh, Mr. Suga, uh, who was about to, um, well, I mean, uh, step down, uh, still attended the uh, Quad Summit. Um, now, there are concerns, however, and I'll just spell it out. Uh, for one thing, um, although the, um, the alliance itself um, broadening uh, into the Indo-Pacific is a welcome development, for Japan and involving Australia is, um, is great. Australia, after all, has a defense agreement with Japan and uh, involving Australia in a much uh, more dense network is a welcome development. And also uh, Tokyo has been keen to develop a defense agreement uh, with the UK. Uh, we don't really have um, an alliance treaty of a kind, but nonetheless, uh, joint military exercises, for example, with UK uh, was taken to be a major step forward. However, um, there are two areas where Japan was not really included in the, uh, in the central core of the alliance. And that the, one is nuclear and two is information. As you can see, when it comes to sharing defense information, Japan is not one of the five eyes. Um, the powers are Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, UK, and of course the United States, but Japan is not included in this. Now, I wouldn't put the blame uh, to, um, to the United States on this because there are domestic reasons um, in Japanese politics that made it quite difficult to join five eyes. Uh, but nonetheless, um, there was this feeling that Japan belongs to uh, well, not the central core of the alliance. After all, NATO always had this um, image that the cent central powers is the United States and the United Kingdom, while continental Europe were, uh, belonged to an important partner, uh, but not at the level uh, of UK. And, and, and that I, can, I think you can see also that um, although Japan and South Korea um, our longtime allies um, of the United States. When it comes to um, defense agreements, uh, well, I would say that South Korea is even has a, a stronger cooperation with the United States than Japan, but nonetheless, um, it is not on the level uh, of one between uh, UK 
and the United States. I'm not going to push forward um, um, on regional or ethnic cultural dimension here, but, uh, but this is essentially an Anglo-Saxon um, cooperation and, um, um, and the role um, of Japan and all South Korea might may not be um, that important. Um, the other matter, uh, the other uh, factor is nuclear. Now, of course, nuclear reactors and nuclear submarines are not included uh, in the global uh, nuclear uh, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, 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 power arrangement. It's not a part of NPT, for example. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, when it comes to nuclear, there are very strong reservations uh, in Japan. And, and I would doubt if uh, Japan, Tokyo would be eager to uh, develop nuclear submarines in the near future. Uh, and, and that position is shared uh, even by heart uh, in Tokyo. Having said that, not going nuclear, not sharing nuclear technology itself may make Japan weaker. So Australia might, uh, might develop nuclear submarines and with American technology. And of course, um, this is a framework that would lead to an even wider um, defense cooperation between the United States and Australia. I, would, I don't doubt that. Um, the impression might be that um, because we can't touch nuclear issues, um, Japan might be left out. Uh, of this alliance management. This essentially is an alliance management issue um, that uh, well, with five eyes and information, Japan is not central. And uh, when it comes to nuclear, Japan again uh, cannot join. So um, that um, it makes, it, um, makes Japan's position different uh, from Australia. Now, uh, Japan is supportive um, of um, Canberra's um, strengthening relationship with Washington. There's no real, real competition here. Uh, but having said that, there are some reservations about that. We just had an election uh, in Japan. And I would um, quite openly say that, uh, well, uh, Kishida uh, would be a far better um, um, Prime Minister, if he can, um, well, uh, <clears throat> work um, his intra, um, intra-party politics uh, right, because he's, he's a well-seasoned um, politician with very good experience in foreign affairs. And, um, and there's a high possibility that the next foreign minister would be Mr. Hayashi, uh, who, was, uh, who has been, well, an Abe's rival in the Yamaguchi prefecture. And the good thing, and the reason I say it's good, is that these are not the hardliners who take a tough position on defense policy for domestic reasons. Uh, there are ideologues um, in Japan uh, who take constitution revision and the historical revisionism and the larger role played by the Japanese military. And to be the goal. Um, and they are essentially talking for domestic hardline constituency, but not about foreign policy. Uh, the Kishida administration is quite different. Uh, Kishida is more of a moderate um, alliance oriented politician. Uh, you might say Kono, and Kono is uh, well unpredictable. Uh, he could have done many things and done many things wrong. So I would rather prefer uh, Kishida. So um, I think when it comes to um, domestic reaction to, um, to AUKUS, um, um, the current administration would be pretty well wise. Uh, it, would, it would not over and um, overreact. Um, it would not um, argue that, um, well, we should go nuclear like Australia. Uh, and, and, and also um, they and Kishida would be careful, careful in working on the balancing act between engagement and deterrence toward China. Uh, one final point. Although I am in general supportive of, um, of strengthening uh, Europe Pacific nexus in alliance, I'm not really sure if this would change China's behavior. Um, strengthening deterrence and capacity, uh, strengthening alliance is different from what we call coercive diplomacy. Uh, changing the behavior of others is different from preventing the other of doing something else. 
And I doubt if an AUKUS, or for that matter, a Quad, would have an effect in changing uh, China's policy toward to a more well Western friendly position. And that uh, is something that we have to work on at a different level. And uh, finally, uh, there's this question about prosperity and security. I certainly agree with uh, Alessio that uh, there can be no prosperity without security. And for that matter, uh, prosperity without um, human rights is yet another issue that should be taken seriously. Having said that, when it comes to trade and economy, oh geez, uh, Japan's position is quite um, um, contradictory. On the one hand, uh, we want to um, um, well um, deter China's possible action. And on the other hand, uh, we do need uh, trade agreements with China and uh, RCEP. Uh, what is the uh, original work, uh, original, uh, work for this? Um, uh, regional co comprehensive economic uh, uh, economic uh, um, um, uh, agreement or something. Um, RCEP uh, is going to be in effect in 2021, January, uh, January next year. And uh, this um, originally was supposed to invite India, but India declined. And instead we have China. Um, I doubt if Tokyo would be eager to invite China into the CPTPP, um, but China is showing its interest. Uh, Japan's policy in trade is quite different from Japan's policy um, in security matters to China. And that division could go a long way um, in defining the um, well long and winding road um, of Japan's approach to China. So I should stop here. Thank you. Wonderful, um, Kiichi. Thank you very, very much. That's uh, that's been very enlightening, about, especially about the Japanese response and that mixture between alarm and concern, which I think uh, I think we can all relate to, and how it fits in as well to um, the broader questions about policies towards China and in the region. Now we've got a lot of questions coming in, and I encourage our audience to submit questions, and I'll get to them immediately after I've asked one question of my own which is just really drawing on uh, Kiichi and Alessio's experience of watching these kind of arrangements. Um, and my question is a basic one. Do you think that this arrangement will actually succeed or, or endure? Um, the, French, the French deal with conventional submarines has fallen apart. Uh, why should we expect the nuclear powered deal to actually succeed and be implemented? There's a lot of details to be in, in, in uh, in, in, uh, inked in um, as this goes through. Kichi, do you, do you think that this absolutely has got legs given also the, the NPT issues and nuclear technology issues for Australia or, or should there still be some doubt? I would say this is a framework um, of which details are, um, uh, have to be filled out. Um, and um, so um, it's way too early um, to predict the success of failure. Um, and that said, I don't think it's going to fall down um, so um, quickly, because um, this framework would lead to an increase in um, um, oh, arms trade, um, defense ties between Australia and the United States, not, not essentially UK, because the UK ha already has a pretty strong relationship with Australia. Um, when it comes to um, defense packs, uh, uh, we ha do have to remember that there was an opposition. Uh, in, uh, in strengthening military ties um, with the United States and um, in Australia. Not much as in New, Ze New Zealand, but not all this. And when it comes to arms trade, um, that was a major issue. Um, that will um, decline uh, significantly, I think. Um, so um, I'm not really sure about nuclear submarines itself. But um, um, nonetheless, um, the agreement would lead to a strengthening uh, trade and very possibly nuclear submarines. I wouldn't rule that out because, uh, well, I mean, this all depends on China's development of a new generation of maritime technology. And, and that sense of urgency uh, would make it easier uh, for the agreement to be accepted. Uh, in both um, Australia and the United States. Uh, France might be angry, um, but the president has to be angry in face of such an issue. It's like a Shinkansen uh, um, and China. So, well, I mean, um, and that cannot be avoided. 
uh, but uh, doesn't um, doesn't really have the power to stop um, this uh, framework. Alessio, do you feel uh, briefly because uh, yeah, so I'll be very brief. I mean, I completely agree with the question with 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 how um, Kichsan uh, presented it. I mean, it always is first and foremost it, 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 it's a, it's a framework agreement, and it's a framework agreement with a specific project in mind, but also with a broader agenda of looking at key collaborations in, in tech and science. So in the long term, will it survive? Well, it is likely if, if, if the three sides continue to feel the need as it is unlikely to disappear, that um, there are aspects of technology that like-minded partner want to preserve and, and sort of protect and develop it together. So as a framework, I think, the longevity will be very much sort of uh, more clearly understood of the next 18 months as the details for this specific contract have been hammered out. But what I would probably say is that uh, what is going to be important to see is the level of formality in the agreements that you see emerging as the details for this contract come up. Because at the moment, um, the, the governments in, in Canberra and London have agreed to it. But how you continue to have you know, um, a, a, a sustainable agreement, regardless of who is in power, is going to be essential for this framework to continue to exist. When it comes to the specificity of the Sunrim program, again, I, I tend to agree with Kiichi. Let's not forget that by the time the, this design needs to start sort of having still cut and the first sort of boats to be uh, shaped, the UK will have to address also its own replacement submarines program. So, so in that sense, the story of today, um, it's one with lots of uncertainty and full of questions. But if you look down the road to 15 years time, well, you might very well see that the, 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 the program has changed in nature. But because of this framework agreement, uh, there is a willingness to actually push it forward, even in forms that are going to be inevitably different from the ones that we're looking at today. Over. Thank you. Yes. Okay. No, that's very helpful. Um, now, so on to the questions. We start with you, Alessio, because Joanna Pittman has asked a, a particularly UK question. She says the UK signed the AUKUS agreement well aware that it would both complicate relations with China, making our Indo-Pacific tilt likely to be seen as more anti-China and have knock-on effects in relationships elsewhere, e.g. France. How should this be handled? Um, and let's try not to mention our uh, fishing disputes in Jersey. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say, so leaving the fishing disputes aside for a minute, um, which is part of the short term knock on effects. And, and I think there was always a calculation in terms of what is the type of game that you're playing. And I think here, AUKUS really needs to be seen in one sense as a long term game. And um, as a long term game in terms of that down payment towards the changing of the strategic sort of balance and at the same time, um, defense and tech cooperation with that nuclear sort of uh, 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 submarine element attached to it. So, in, 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 you know, and I think there was a very clear sense coming out of number 10 that um, the risk assessment uh, 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 sort of uh, game was being done and, 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 and it was worth it. Uh, now, um, I think that the, the real question is, regardless of whether you have AUKUS or not, would the Chinese feel contained if you do anything? Probably, and they would reserve the right to have an opinion about it anyway. So the, the calculation insofar as China is concerned, um, in, in regards to what AUKUS is doing, um, I think is, is, is yes, but again, uh, the, 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 this content coming out of China has been pretty standard. Put it this way, reactions have not been as, 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 as a theory as one would have imagined. So, so I, I don't think that the China question matters as much as what has happened in terms of the relationship with, with France, which Europe remains the UK's closest military and security partner. And regardless of what President Macron says about strategic autonomy, when it comes to defence and security cooperation in a practical sense, even for France, there has been no option, and there is no option in the foreseeable future other than the UK within the European context. And that's because of the Lancaster agreements and what they brought about in that relationship. So in that sense, Johnnies are absolutely right in asking this question. This has to be handled. 
Now, how do you do this? I think at the moment, number 10 um, is, is looking at this as, as a question whereby you need to give it a little bit of time because the domestic politi politics in France are changing. There is an election coming up next year and there was no way um, in which uh, President Macron would have reacted differently, right? So you have to accept that you are going through stormy seas. But at the same time, I think it was interesting um, that the dialogue between the two governments insofar as the preparation of COP26 was concerned seemed to be ongoing. So whilst on the surface, the political narrative is one of outrage and betrayal, um, and I think at the substance level, uh, the working relationship continues. And, and certainly, depending on how the elections go in, in France, we might see the tones of the current situation changing very quickly in 18 months' time. Thank you. Now, um, Kichi, you made the excellent point about how, um, from a Japanese and South Korean point of view, um, there's a sense that there's quite a distinction between, if you like, the Anglo-Saxon um, or uh, kind of security arrangements, particularly in intelligence and uh, and um, the uh, actual the alliances in East Asia. Martin Hadfield has asked really about this. Um, a big part of the of the West concerned has to be to reinforce the multilateral order that requires encouraging India, Southeast Asia, as well as consolidating ROK, Japanese, etc. Report. How does the creation of a limited Anglophone security alliance contribute to that? And I'll add another question to it, um, which I've lost now. Oh, uh, oh yeah, Kasim Sidat, who I noticed joined us from Australia, uh, actually from Perth. Um, is AUKUS evidence that the Anglosphere can still go it alone and doesn't yet really need foreign, quotes, help? Mm -hmm. um, now, so that's two sides of it. Um, how do we actually connect together, Kiichi, um, mm -hmm. after this? Um, and, or, and do you, from a Japanese point of view, do you see this as evidence of a, of a continued Anglophone attitude of, uh, of distinction and, in a way, separation between the two spheres? I did hear such concerns, yes, um, and although I doubt if that is the real uh, focus um, or focus, um, it was almost, well, um, inevitable that, um, that um, the, this um, framework uh, would be interpreted as, uh, as an Anglophone or Anglo-Saxon an um, alliance. Uh, but um, at the same time, I don't think the United States or UK can do without um, Anglo-Saxon powers. Um, UK or the United States or Japan needs continental Europe, uh, Germany, France, um, and uh, we certainly need um, participation. Uh, um, I would say that, um, uh, that the US, the UK, uh, and Australia needs participation of um, South Korea and Japan. Um, and it is quite unrealistic uh, to think that, uh, that um, a Commonwealth plus the United States um, can dominate the world. It's not going, uh, going to be the case. Um, it ain't going to happen, let me put it this way. Um, and the most serious question is the kind of multilateralism we're working on. Mm. We have multilateralism on, in trade uh, which is in many ways endangered, but nonetheless, um, uh, we're doing some patchwork on, on it. And the CPTPP and, and, or RCEP are um, an attempts uh, to that effect. On the other hand, there's multilateralism minus China that is uh, developing quite quickly for obvious reasons. And that includes Quad, that includes AUKUS, and that includes um, all the joint uh, military exercises between uh, NATO powers. And um, and um, uh, well, Asian um, uh, partners here. Um, so that would be a critical issue. Um, having said that, whenever you give an impression that uh, you don't need us, that you're bypassing our participation, alliance is endangered. Um, if um, Tokyo thinks um, Tokyo is not included. And this dialogue will be in trouble and well, very possibly uh, US or UK would be in trouble as well. Um, I'm not that pessimistic about it when it comes to US-Japan relations. I'm pretty sure that Japan will try to join the Five Eyes. Uh, there's a great demand for that 
and then that requires changes in Japan's domestic legislation as well. But uh, because of the security concerns, that would be um, a, a priority. When it comes to um, going nuclear, um, even if nuclear, even if it's about nuclear submarines, I don't think it will happen in Japan or for that matter, South Korea. And after all, um, the limit of participation uh, has its own domestic origins. And, and, and finally, um, uh, could be a related issue, um, ASEAN's reaction to this. Now, um, there has been, well, uh, reservations about um, Australia's naval um, strategy in some ASEAN nations. ASEAN nations' position toward China and Australia are quite divided. And, um, and involving ASEAN in the dialogue um, could be, um, could, will have to be uh, dealt with very carefully. Um, and, and that goes for um, not only UK, but um, more principally Australian government. Thank you. And that neatly answers a question or deals with a question that Eugene Chia um, asked about ASEAN um, and including mentioning, of course, the Southeast Asia nuclear weapons free zone um, as an obstacle. Um, but Paul Diamond has also asked about President Duterte of the Philippines, <laughs> who's recently endorsed us. <laughs> How significant is that? Well, perhaps he won't be president for much longer anyway, <laughs> um, in any case. Um, I mean, but uh, is, is, is that of any significance, do you think, Kiji? Uh, uh, the Philippines doesn't want to be left out, um, to put it very simply. Uh, whenever the um, uh, U.S. Uh, makes a move um, that bypasses uh, the Philippines, and that uh, leaves um, a fear of abandonment. The trouble is um, they fear abandonment, but they also fear in, uh, entanglement. Um, so um, both the, uh, both the um, dilemmas um, of an alliance uh, would be there. And Duterte uh, is, um, uh, has had very strong uh, reservations about the United States um, strengthening cooperation, but he has changed gears uh, and in recent years, and uh, he, he really wants to um, strengthen um, defense ties uh, with the United States. The trouble is he also wants to work with China. So um, he's not really um, um, a neutral observer um, in this process, and, and, and the Philippines definitely wants to be involved. I doubt if uh, Malaysia or Thailand would uh, show similar reactions to it, however. Now, Alessio, um, there's a question, um, well, a, a point made by Ross uh, Chiaravalo, um, saying, pointing out that the Yorkers deal is much broader than just the nuclear subs part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that's true. And we, you might just come on to that and the other elements of it from your point of view in, in London, but also on the nuke, on submarines, Nicholas McLean has asked about would Australian submarines in the Taiwan Strait deter China from invading the island? or actually make an invasion more likely before the eight submarines are in service, all of which is a way of saying, of asking the question, well, how much difference do eight nuclear-powered submarines make? Um, so, is so, so, so let me take in, 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 the, in the order you present the question. Um, so, so first of all, I completely uh, agree with Ross. Um, and, and as I said in my remarks, this isn't about the submarine. The submarine uh, is, is, is the first project. It's, 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 a, it's a, a first... Um, clear sort of uh, concrete experiment of what is a fundamental link between security and prosperity and one in which technology in the maritime context has a significant role to play and so that wider custom science and tech cooperation in defense has a particular important meeting a uh, meaning and and that meaning casts a much wider net on what's happening with AUKUS. This leads to a second point. I think there's a, there's a lot of confusion. People tend to use the word alliance with, with, with a, a bit too leisurely, um, in my view. Because an alliance, is a, from, from a legal point of view, includes some sort of mutual defense agreement, an Article 5, either NATO style or one of the bilateral agreements that the US has in the Indo-Pacific. Now, let's, let's face it, that kind of commitment Article 5 thing, in 2021, 
It's not going to happen. If NATO did not exist, it would not be invented. If the bilateral security alliance that the United States has with Japan, South Korea, and so on, they will not be created today, period. That's a pretty safe assumption, I think, to, to work on. And AUKUS, as a result, does not gauge that sort of like uh, uh, Cold War mentality, to borrow a, a Global Times uh, fav all-time favorite expression, is very much a manifestation of Kichi's point about multilateralism. What we are looking at in the Indo-Pacific is a situation in which the original hub and spokes is actually morphing into a, some sort of a, a, a series of nodes connected together, bilaterally and multilaterally. AUKUS speaks to one particular form of multilateralism, which is what I call the realpolitik minilateralism, a minilateral organization of, of, of three core members in which they get together to address a particular vulnerability or a particular issue. In this case, it started off on a conversation on the back of an envelope on, well, the mandate has changed, nuclear subs, nuclear leg submarines are something that we want to pursue. Can you help us? And then it becomes something bigger. So in that space, I think I, 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 I like the idea to think about minilateral formations like AUKUS, like QUAD, like five power defense arrangements, of which there are quite a few in the Indo-Pacific space, as all parts, they're not mutually exclusive. You don't go, I, I don't like the framing of the idea, this is, a, this is an Anglo-Saxon versus something else. They all coexist in the same space and they all play different roles. Now, why this matters? It matters because uh, the question that Nicholas was uh, asking about Australian um, submarines needs to, the answer to that question depends on whether you're looking at it from a tactical point of view or a strategic point of view. If the conversation we're having is the invasion of Taiwan happening tomorrow, these things are not useful, but then will it happen tomorrow? Not really. Admiral Davidson has provided us a window of the likelihood of this to happen from a purely military point of view, as in six years. But from a political point of view, that's not guaranteed. It means that in six years, the CCP will have an option to pursue all things being equal, that option. But it, it doesn't mean that they will pursue that option. Xi Jinping has made it clear that it's got plans and, and Kichi was making this point to go elsewhere, right? So at a tactical level, if you want, the question doesn't really matter whether Australia is 8 to 12, 20, because it's the condition of what is going to uh, happen about Taiwan that needs to be debated in the first place. However, if we look at the question of the eight submarines in the longer term, in terms of how they become part of a network, then that situation changes. Because the point about AUKUS, QUAD, is about pooling capabilities together. Kiichi san made this point over and over again about multilateral exercises. What is the point besides a nice, you know, Kodak happy moment with nice pics that you can have on Twitter? The point of that is to create the soft tissue of doctrinal grammar that is shared by core allies who all feel that they cannot do things alone and why should they, one could ask, but that by pooling resources together, you are creating an integrated network of responses, if you want, to a broader set of issues in which a nuclear subs combined with what the Americans have, what, what the Japanese have, what the UK could have, then it becomes changing the picture. This is about playing a game that sets our competitors on the back foot. The advantage that the UK, Japan, US, Australia have, they have friends. Working with your friends is a place to start. And that's how I'm framing it in terms of answer. Excellent answer. Thank you very much. Now, uh, um, Kiichi, Simon Shelton, um, who formerly worked, has, well, he still works, but uh, worked uh, deep in the defense industry, has asked, um, about these mini lateralism, mini lateral arrangements, uh, really, um, as he says, AUKUS can be seen as a new type of strategic security alignment with a focus on equipment and capability, but not limited to nuclear submarines. Could this just be the first within the region? Might there be potential for something like JUKUS, with mm -hmm. common interests in future fighter and space development? Could there be other agreements in the Indo-Pacific? What's your uh, crystal ball on this question, uh, Kiichi-san, from, from a Tokyo point of view? And that's a question from Simon Chowton, I, I yes. think. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, uh, I don't really have a crystal ball, uh, but um, 
Yes, AUKUS could be a beginning um, of several defense agreement um, plans. Uh, some of them are weak in uh, legal institutions, some of them are uh, pretty much complete. Um, such ideas can pop around um, uh, uh, with um, very specific um, proposals. Um, every nation wants to be included in an, in an, in an alliance that um, strengthen their national um, power. Uh, and, so, and so, some alliances um, don't work in that direction. So, so um, there, there'll be new ideas and new meetings and competing in each other. Uh, some would be more successful than others. And um, in the end, however, uh, what we will see is, um, is a more viable uh, institutional um, network that faces mm. China. Mm -hmm. and, and that I would rather see in the movement of arms, arms trade. It's um, a very important element here. Um, are they really selling uh, submarines? Um, are they buying those planes? Uh, these defense contracts can go a long way mm -hmm. in, in offering the substance um, of, um, of an agreement. That I don't think I can uh, go into in so much detail. Um, Ancas us... hmm. was not um, 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 a clear institution, um, but that kind of an idea would um, well come on the table and we'll have these discussions because we don't understand it. Now, just uh, in our last few minutes, um, Alessio, here's a question which is gets to the, two questions which gets to the heart of Britain's role in this in this uh, and uh, agreement. I mean, and, and uh, someone who doesn't give his name asks, um, why did the Australia approach the UK first instead of the US? If they needed nuclear submarines, why didn't they just use the ANZUS framework? What was Britain's role in Australia's acquisition of uh, of nuclear submarines? And uh, and I've lost the other question, but it. It basically, you know, it seems to have disappeared. It basically asked whether, in the way that Britain had played its role in this, while we Brits might see it as being part of our credibility globally, uh, could it not also actually seen as part of our, our role as an unreliable ally, an unreliable partner, troublemaker in alliances, and given the role that we've played in, in a way, brokering a, a, an anti-French deal from some points of view? Ah, well, let me take this in reverse, in, in reverse because the, the, the two questions. First of all, I'm always very surprised by 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 the the, 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 the intellectual assumption underpinning the second the second question because it, it kind of like removes Australian agency to choose what they want to do with their policy away from them, and yes. I think that that's a bit unfair. You know, because the, the, this was not designed, it's not for the UK to decide who should be warned and how they should be sort of warned and made aware of things. My understanding from, from, from um, interactions with people that were involved into uh, the AUKUS negotiations at the UK end, um, the UK had asked uh, to, to see sort of uh, where things stood with, with France. And, and only over time, we'll see the extent to which awareness was there. But there was a sense of due diligence as in like, you know, how are you dealing with the others? Having said so, at the end of the day, it was always in Prime Minister Morrison's own remit to decide how far to inform others and where to go. So we cannot, it's really hard to answer that kind of question because it assumes that the Australians don't have a say into who builds their submarines, whereas it should start, that's their say. Now, as we, the information is starting to sort of unfold and, and, and become clearer, clearly there was miscommunication, clearly there was uh, uh, unclarity, the extent to which the two sides claim things are as we understand them today, we will need time to understand it. As a historian, I find very problematic to come to a definitive judgment if we don't have all the evidence um, in front of us. So that sort of covers the element. But and, and so, I, so, so the question of unreliability, if anything, the UK works, was extremely reliable because 
of the three parties is the only one that didn't leak anything to the media on the day it was announced. The first leaks came from the US side. Um, and then, and then later on during the day from 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 the UK. So, and, and in the UK, we know at the moment from from what the media have covered and, and released that less than about a dozen people knew about it. So, if you went to main building to someone in policy division, sorry, at the MOD, they would know that there was negotiation going. So, this was a national security secretary led negotiation and was very much kept very core, playing their cards close to the chest. So everything that we started to understand about the UK management of this, assuming that the UK does not have a say on how France learn about it, because that's an Australian led question, I think it speaks to reliability and to that convening power that the integrated review had set out as an ambition for Britain and moving forward. Now, the first question, how did the story come that the UK was approached? Well, first of all, um, the US has a long-standing uh, uh, policy of not, I mean, outside of Britain, nobody else have a, um, had access to um, nuclear reactor technology for some reasons. This is one of the most secret, secretive, and, uh, you know, one of the, 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 if not the most sensitive type of technology to share with anybody. So you can only do with those you trust the most. And outside the UK, there was no experience in the US that happened. My understanding is also that it was a, a certain set of fortuitous circumstances. The first sea lord that was in Australia meeting his counterpart, when the conversation came up, the first sea lord took the piece of information, came back home and uh, presented that information directly to the national security advisor and then <laughs> left the ball in their corner to deal with it. And it seems to me that says something about the fact that the UK as a negotiating party in this, because of the proximity of the relationship on nuclear reactors that the UK has with the US, and also with the use of nuclear um, uh, submarines as part of their strategic deterrent, could have an initial conversation about this, perhaps in a way Australia could not. But Australia also has other conversations ongoing with the UK very specific that perhaps does not have with the US. So in that sense, the UK became an easy entry point, um, a, a, a gateway keeper, if you want, um, in order to have that conversation happening. So from that respect, I think it speaks very much to the point I was making in my remarks on, on key for the UK to deliver on the Pacific tilt in a way that does not upset partners, does not under deliver, and does not upset potential competitors, is to strike that very difficult hard balance between what you can do, where you can be helpful, and then securing something that provides an advantage back to you as well. Uva. Thank you. That's fascinating and um, very helpful. We, I think for me, particularly listening to this fascinating discussion, I've learned a lot from, um, uh, from Alessio about the UK's position and the UK's role, which I think has been uh, very valuable for me, and from Kiichi about... Uh, Japanese attitude and the Japanese role and position in uh, in in this whole issue, and in in particular, I would remind about your comments, Kiichi san about um, about the new Kishida government and the possible new foreign minister and the distinction in the nature of foreign policy between that approach and the more domestic hardliner type approach. So that I think is something I will keep in mind in watching the evolution of this of the Kishida administration going going forward. So I've, we've run out of time, sadly. So thank you all for very excellent questions. Um, there's a few I couldn't quite get to, but um, uh, it's been a terrific discussion. I thank you, Alessio Patalano, and you, Kiichi Fujiwara, for giving up the time and sharing your expertise with us on this very important subject. So I wish you a very good evening and good day, respectively. Uh, and thank you to all the audience for joining. Thanks a lot. Bye.